Blog Talk Radio. My name is Dr. Michael Rice, and welcome to Mind Shifters Radio. We are back again, our normal, our new normal two to three time slot, talking about forgiveness in the most ancient sense of the word as it was taught in the Aramaic language. Our focus is to create support for any and everybody on the planet that wants to tap into and start to change the internal dynamics of their lives. We're working with a, a, a forgiveness process that has to do not with letting other people off the hook, but how do you change the internal dynamics in your life? And we're delighted that you're here with us. We're looking forward to an awesome show. And uh, if you'd like to uh, call in and touch into what we're speaking about, if you have questions, if you have thoughts, we'd be delighted to hear from you. And I think Jeannie is on in the background. Let's check and see what's happening in the uh, chat room or calls, Jeannie. Hi. Good morning. We've got several people out there, but right now they're just all listening. Um, The call-in number is 646. 200-4169. 200-4169. Give us a call. Ask your questions. Very cool. So the direction that we're going, if you're not familiar with the work that we're talking about, you're certainly welcome to go to our website, which is www.whyagain.com. And... On our website, you can download a copy of our book free, Why Is This Happening to Me Again? Uh, You can download it in several languages, uh, the commitments, worksheets. Uh, Jeannie is the webmaster. Acknowledgements to Jeannie for the fabulous job she's done with the website. And you can spend weeks on that website and not find every corner. And around every corner, there's another piece of gold. And our, our desire is to give away this gold to every mind, heart, and being on the planet. And so uh, we were fortunate uh, to have uh, Carol Guy hosting us to do this radio show so that uh, as we travel, you know, one of the challenges in the past has always been to uh, to give support to people once we leave an arena, once we leave an area, because we travel all over the globe. So this way uh, we can talk to you for an hour a day, uh, five days a week, and answer questions and give you all the support we possibly can as you engage in the ancient Aramaic work of forgiveness and all the tools that uh, correlate and go along with it. Of course, you can also order DVDs and CDs. And and if you're finding yourself benefiting from this work, we're certainly delighted if you'd be uh, interested in donating to support us and keeping this moving forward. You can do that by going to our website. And on the right-hand side, you'll see a little link that says Donate. And uh, when we travel and we teach, our workshops are done free. We'll be doing a free series beginning March the 6th if you're in South Florida. Or if you want to get away from that winter weather up there, come down for a week or so. We'll be starting a six-day free series March the 6th in Pompano Beach, Florida. We'll be starting with Why Is This Happening to Me Again? And then moving into relationships and communication. And uh, we'll be doing a thing on the introduction to advanced understanding of A Course in Miracles. So we'll be covering a lot of territory in that six days. And then the... Final two days, uh, the Saturday and Sunday following March 6th, I believe it's the 12th and 13th, we'll be doing a uh, an intensive, a, a mini intensive, two days, and looking at stress, uh, looking at uh, breath work, mind shifters, and still point breathing, purpose. We'll be opening uh, new files and new directions with uh, the work we'll be doing. So. If you uh, would like to join us, we'll be at Unity of Pompano. The worksheet is on the flyer, or the, the flyer is on the, uh, the website. You're certainly welcome to tap in there as well. All right. Uh, one of the things that um, I would like to say is uh, Terry, had, Terry Bowling is on the air there. So uh, he had asked the other day when we were on the radio about putting the um, schematics of the human mind with the three filters on the website. So Terry, it is out there now, and also we did a uh, Empowered to Heal workshop the other night, and some people were asking about that chart, about how the different emotions and things that are going down and what organs they impact and everything. So that chart is also out there. You can get both of those if you go to download worksheets. Terry, you're on the air. Hi, Terry. I didn't realize I 
realize I was on the air. Um, yeah, well, that is fantastic. And that, and the addition to the um, chart through the organs, that, that's very nice, too. Thanks, Jeannie. That, that's awesome. Those are two really great tools that uh, as I develop my understanding more and more of the work, I can see how that uh, assists me in, a, in processing some of the things that come up. And um, well, the sport of my blog is... Um, hmm? If you think of any others, please let me know. I'll get them out there. Okay, I'll do it. I was thinking, now, Michael, today I was... Um, go ahead. I was just going to say there are lots of tools on the website for anybody that wants to tap in. And for anybody that doesn't know Terry, uh, let me introduce him. And I don't know if David's uh, available, but David, if you get a chance to call in. David and Terry are residents at Heartland, our teaching center in the Ozarks. And actually, next week, while Jeannie and I are away and not accessible to uh, telephone, uh, they will be doing the radio show and uh, talking about their experiences at Heartland and the projects at Heartland and and what's going on with the tools there, what will be happening this summer, and uh, and their experience of using the tools. David uh, has been working with the tools now for about, gee, I think, seven or eight years. And he called me out of the blue one day and said he'd been listening to my tapes for a couple of years and finally realized there was more information available. And it happened to be, if I remember correctly, I think it was on a Monday, and we were starting intensive on a Friday. David was in Chicago, and he zipped down and was at that next intensive, and and then the next year he said, well, I want to deepen my experience of this work, so I'm going to take a year off and I'm going to come and live at Heartland and be part of the support team. Uh, lo and behold, uh, David was there about three weeks and said, I'm not leaving. I'm, I'm, I'm here. This is it. I'm a lifer. So David is uh, part of our support at Heartland. And Terry, uh, Terry's been doing the tools for, I guess, seven or eight years now. And uh, he uh, started to show up more and more often. David got him involved in the building the brain cells came and, that drew uh, Terry to Heartland, and he's our resident, our our artiste in residence, does some amazing art, and uh, and also a contractor who's running projects at Heartland. We're just uh, getting ready in a couple of weeks to put a, a new roof on one of the buildings. Uh, so if uh, anybody wants to come and get some experience in doing that, we're working with the Experimental Rice Hall building and developing community that's uh, tapped into the use of these tools. So, Terry, uh, we're glad you're here. Thank you, Michael. Or there, I should say. Pardon me. I should say yeah. we're glad you're there. We're here. Yeah. You're there. <laughs> yeah. And we're in Florida. We're glad we're here. And we're delighted that you're there supporting us, Terry. Thank you. Thank you. So is there anything in particular on your mind today? Uh, have you uh, figured out the direction that you're going to be taking the show next week? Have you and David talked about that yet? Uh, well, we've talked about it a little bit. We don't have um, an outline, and we're working on that. We'll have a we'll we'll have a topic, a general topic, a theme for each day, and then, uh, of course, be open to whatever's up for folks who are calling in and uh, what their questions are, and uh, guide the program through that process. Awesome, awesome. Mm-hmm. So, do you have anything on your uh, mind for today? Yes. Um, chapter 17, uh, I was reading that this morning. The body has a mind of its own in, the file, in your examples of the file folder effects and the, with the tuning fork and the cars. And, um, I, I got another um, level of insight into the simplic- simplicity, um, the, the, the statement that you make uh, a a simple. I'm getting a little confusion. I got a lot of stuff coming on, going on around. As processing this, is that um, things are complex to a complex mind, and simple to a simple mind. Is that's just kind of a loose paraphrase there. Or, yeah, actually, it's simple to a simplified mind, not necessarily simple. a simple mind, but but one that's had has done some work and taken the complexities out. Everything becomes a whole lot simpler. Yeah, I like that. Simple has a little implication there of. Uh, Things that I'll do a worksheet on. <laughs> so, um, what I, what I got an insight though on was that that whole to me for that for a moment it was as if the whole worksheet in a very simplified presentation is about that file folder effect and clearing out what how those files just open up. They're there, and I've heard it and talked with the, I start to laugh a little bit because. Well, I start putting it into words. It's like, oh, I don't know. 
But uh, the simplicity of it is what struck me and said, wow, now in teaching and sharing this with other folks, to get that one uh, piece across of how that file folder effect works and to invite in the experience of that, is, that explains pretty much the whole worksheet process. It definitely uh, keys right into over, the over. worksheet process. Right, and one we're, we're, actually, I'm rewriting the book, uh, which you, of course, know, Terry, but others might not. I'm rewriting the book. Why is this happening to me again? And we're going to do a revision of that chapter. It's going to be pretty significant because what I've been realizing since I originally wrote that book, you know, I was calling it the body's mind, and the truth is, the body doesn't have a mind. Uh, all it is is a, it's a database. It's a literally a multi generational database, and I've been looking for several years for language to to reflect that accurately and simply, but what's there is simply a thousand generations of whatever's happened in our bloodline, and that database is designed to be our servant. It's designed to hold data for us, and and when we need it, give it to us. When we don't need it, shut up and stay out of the way. And sadly, because we've created through denial a lot of emotional impact in that database, uh, it oftentimes tends to run us and, and oftentimes against our own will and choice. And so uh, to see that really it's it's simply a, a massive accumulation of information, it tends to source the pictures and the world that we see. It's not necessary for it to be that way, but for most people that's how it works. And we see the mind's representation of what's happening in the world instead of experiencing directly what's happening in the world. And if you look at the ancient spiritual teachers, the whole idea was to get to the point where we could literally directly experience what was happening in the world, directly experience relationship with each other, rather than through this multi-generational database, which tends to uh, always have its two cents to put in. You know, if we go into relationship with someone, and well, well, I've used the example in the Why Is This Happening to Me Again workshop of the young man who, is brought up in a one-room schoolhouse. Mom is his teacher, uh, and mom is a marker artist. I use markers when I when I teach the workshop, and and so I hold the marker up and ask how many people see a marker, and everybody goes, "Yeah, I see the marker in your hand, Michael." And I offer, "No, you don't. You don't see the marker in my hand. Uh, you see an image in your brain, but the image in your brain is not of the marker in my hand. It's your brain's replication of it." They go on to point out how this young man goes from kindergarten to grade eight with mom who's his teacher and an awesome artist, and they have this wonderful, loving relationship. And, you know, almost every day he's there after school playing and, and working with art with mom as she's, you know, doing things she needs to handle. And and now here he is at the age of 50. He is a world-renowned marker artist. And then we have a second young man who, uh, kindergarten, grade 8, similar situation, except mom isn't very kind and uh and she happens to be a good shot. And every time he steps out of line, kindergarten, grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, every time he turns his head the wrong way, she fires a marker at it. And um, on a couple of occasions, uh, she he turns the wrong at the wrong moment and, and gets a marker in the eye and ends up in the hospital. Now, we say those two young men see a marker uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years later. But... They're not seeing the same marker. Each mind produces a different image. Each mind produces a different experience. And if we think that when the mind is giving us an image of a marker, that we're experiencing the marker that's out there in the world, we're mistaken. We're experiencing a projection from the content of this multi-generational database. If the content contains wonderful, happy, healthy, as it is grand, then we have a healthy, happy, wonderful experience of whatever we're looking at. Now, of course... Many people say, well, you know, uh, okay, so, so so a marker, so what? Who cares? Well, let's shift it into relationship. If you have a relationship, say, for instance, with someone of the opposite sex and your parental figure, your power person was kind of gruff and mean or maybe abusive verbally, emotionally, physically, sexually, all that content is used in forming your brain's picture of others. 
And when your brain's picture comes forward, if you're sure that you're looking at the person you're in relationship with rather than the contents of your own brain, you're going to have trouble in your relationships. Once you realize that what you're looking at is your brain's image, then there's an indicator that will tell you whether you're actually experiencing that other person or whether you're experiencing what's going on in your body's multi-generational database from the past. And the indicator is, if there's hostility or fear, it's because stored somewhere in the cellular structure is hostility or fear resonated by that person, just like the marker resonates the fear of the kid who used to get them shot at his head all the time, just like the kid who has wonderful memories of mom and, and markers, you know, each of them experiences a totally, completely different marker. And continuously we have totally, completely different experiences until we clean out the database, put it on neutral, and then in doing so develop the actual spiritual faculties with which to go directly to an experience in the world instead of experiencing it through the content of our mind. Then we're stepping into actual life and our work is about supporting people and being able to do that so that we can really truly experience each other as we are rather than through our multi-generational database which for most people has a little craziness in it and as we started out with the idea you know if there are a lot of complexities in there if there was intellectual curiosity and complexity and you know big stories that went along with everything then the mind makes anything and everything complex if it's simplified once you move the complexity out, gee, all of a sudden, gee, it really becomes pretty simple. So we have any calls, Cheney? Anything in the uh, chat room? Anything else? Any other thoughts, Terry? Nobody has their hand up or anything, and there's several people in the chat room right now. And um, one of them, when you were given that description, typed in that it was bi um, biological intelligence when you were discussing the... Oh. Yeah, yeah or, or maybe in the case of the kid with the, the uh, mom who threw markers and said biological non-intelligence. There's, there's no real intelligence there. All it does is feedback what's in there. If it's ugly, it feeds back ugly. If it's beautiful, it feeds back beautiful. Uh, and and it, it makes it look like that content is about what's going on in the world. And the truth is it's not about what's going on in the world. It's about what's going on inside of us. And ultimately, you want to remove both the ugly and the beautiful, forgive, take away that emotional content and complexity so that you get to experience things directly as they are. And that's when human life really starts. Yeah. So, Terry, are you still with us? Has David uh, has been able to show up? David is not on. No? Okay. Cool. Yeah, I'm still here, and uh, that was a good clarification process for me. I was working on the board a little bit as you were talking, and um, what uh, I was grasping was the simplicity of the example of the file folder and effect and how that shows the principle behind the worksheet, not that it, oh, that's the whole thing about the worksheet. I think that was sort of kind of the way I phrased it earlier, but there's the, the principle behind it that uh, shows how it works. And I've got a, a little deeper understanding, a, a big, bigger understanding, a better understanding, a clearer understanding of the um, principle behind that file folder effect and how that is the uh, driver to the worksheet. That's, that's kind of what's processing through me right now. So I'm I'm having a... I'm having a good time with it. Yeah. Awesome. Fabulous. Hmm. Okay, so when um, we... we oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeannie. I was just going to say we had um, Patrick in the chat room ask um, that we also put out on the website the correspondence that you did where you compared the forgiveness work that we do with the 12 steps. And so I uh -huh. told him that we would get that and get it out there for them to, to utilize. That That is an awesome tool to see the comparison. 
Yeah, that's something we need to look at. We're going to need to – actually, I just thought of that a little earlier, Jeannie. We're going to have to look at um, editing that and uh, sending it to the station and having that before we leave. That's a, going to be a task. Yeah. But anyway, yes, we will work on that. The uh, the uh, correlation with the 12 steps is, is pretty awesome and uh, uh, gives a, an opportunity in particular to take that – forgiveness process deeper inside a lot of times when we're taking an inventory as we tie in with what we're talking about here now we're taking an inventory based on what's in this database and uh, we tend to do it through projection and when we're doing a projected inventory we're really not at depth and what the one of the things the reality management worksheet uh, assists one in doing is to get to totally, completely different level of the mind to uh, look at and inventory the content that's there and move to the place where that content is no longer in control. Most people, you know, in the ancient uh, world, they would say that many people are masters bound by the servants in their own temples, their own household. And what we're looking to do is to restore each master to their rightful place. That is, to be in charge of your temple, its database, its information, its realities, and have it obeying and following your instructions rather than running you. And so it creates a whole different, uh, whole different dynamic when, uh, when you step to that place. So do we have any other thoughts in the chat room at this moment? Uh, so we open another topic? Where do we want to go, folks? I say go with another topic. We are still clear. There's about 20 people out there listening, but nobody's talking. All right. Well, we're glad you're with us, all of you from wherever you are from. And uh, this work of forgiveness is uh, is so powerful at allowing us to look at what's under the surface. And, and the, the core of what we're doing comes out of the ancient Aramaic, as we've said before, and to recognize the depth of understanding that they had thousands of years ago in the Aramaic language is absolutely awesome. And the, the, the language carries meanings that in our culture, you know, we think we're so enlightened in our culture, we still haven't even started to figure out yet. And in the Aramaic language, and, and of course, one of the interesting things is we don't know what we don't know yet. Um, for those who might not be aware of it, I'm the director of a foundation that's translating a copy of the oldest known New Testament in Aramaic into English. And in Aramaic, the New Testament is a physics dissertation. It's not a theological dissertation. It's about physics, it's about physiology, it's about psychology and how the world works and what your part is in it and how to take charge of and move through it in the most efficient ways possible by understanding how the whole energy system works. And uh, we're uh, actually looking to and in the process of working toward creating a team to carry the translation work that we've been doing on to the next level uh, because at this stage, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, you know, for almost 2,000 years in the uh, Western world, uh, there was no knowledge that there was such a thing as the unconscious. It's been in the Aramaic for thousands of years, and of course, they credit Freud with uh, with discovering it. Freud didn't discover it. It was well known long, long, long before Freud showed up. And uh, we don't know what else is going to show up as we develop the brain cells and the understanding of, uh, of what this whole process of life is about, what the ancients understood and what we can learn from them. Uh, so far, it's absolutely awesome to be able to get to where you, uh, you really start to see what it is they were talking about. And, you know, there's, there's an interesting piece in that, in the puzzle. And... This one is, is such a key when you have the brain cells for it. Uh, you'll hear people ask the man named Yeshua, what's the first law? And Yeshua is the man who's popularly known as Jesus, 
but his name was not Jesus, which is a copy of the Greek god Zeus. Uh, his name was Yeshua. And they said, what's the first law? And all this you're telling us, what's the first law? Now, let's let go of the, any idea that there's anything in this conversation about theology. Let's let go of uh, all the religious slants that have been given to it. Let's just look at the simple fact of what was being said. And what was said was the first law was that of love, and you must love God, neighbor, self. And there are 17 different words translated by one English word, love, and the word is rachma. Rachma is a filter over the frontal lobes of the brain. <laughs> Who knew that one? We thought it was something you were supposed to do to your neighbor. <laughs> no, it had nothing to do with what you did to your neighbor. It was about how you maintained a condition in your mind that kept you sane that inoculated against you against a hostile, fearful world. And, of course, we have people out there making fun of those things because they would love to have everybody in their hostile, fearful game because people who are hostile and fearful are pretty stupid. They're pretty controllable. And there are people who just love to have controllable people. And as they are able to run people's lives through their hostility and fear they are able to take over their assets. In Aramaic, loving your neighbor had to do with maintaining a condition in your mind that created a gateway for a human life to show up, created a gateway for the active presence of love. And whenever you looked at any object of attention, be it the creator, be it your neighbor, and in Aramaic, neighbor means anybody you think about, or be it yourself, the requirement of the law, that is, if you want to have a human life, you keep this gateway open. You keep it active. Your mind is sane. That's the, uh, and you can check on the website under download worksheets and you'll see a schematic for the human mind. And that's what uh, Terry was talking about when we first first came on about what, what Jeannie had put on the website. And this gateway, staying open, having that condition active, keeps the mind on track with its highest and best possibilities. And then an interesting thing is said. It says, for upon this hangs the law in all its prophets. In Aramaic, it makes the prophets a possession of the law. And it says that the first thing in understanding the law and the prophets is maintaining this condition called Rachma. Now, if you look at some of the rageful, abusive, um, tragic attitudes of people who have trouble maintaining love in their minds, would rather rage at people, would rather rail on people. And they do. These people interpret the words of the man who said, the first condition for understanding my words is you've got to have love in your mind. And so I I support people in questioning deeply any words that you've ever heard spoken by someone who when the slightest thing goes wrong, the slightest thing is out of place in their lives, moves into hostility or fear because they're not meeting the condition required to understand that teaching. And they've made up all sorts of things that simply aren't based in love, simply don't have anything to do with the truth. And as, so as you recognize this, maintaining the condition of Rockland, maintaining the condition of love, and recognizing that if hostility or fear comes up in you, now your mind will tell you somebody else has a problem, but the truth is if hostility or fear comes up in you, you have a problem. And that's kind of the basic thesis of our work. So if I'm in hostility or fear, I have a problem. I need to be about forgiving. I need to remove my hostility or fear to get back to a sane mind. And so we invite everyone who would be in any form of hostility or fear to start to question the output of their minds. And most people don't question the output of their minds when they're in hostility or fear. They're absolutely sure that what is going on in their multi-generational database, and they call it thinking, it's got nothing to do with thinking at all, they're absolutely sure that what's going on in their multi-generational database is absolutely true about somebody else. And, you know, they have to make up their minds whether they should puke on them or not. (laughs) 
if you're going through that kind of a process, don't believe that you know what the law and the prophet said because you just missed the first piece. And, you know, if you don't have the protocol, I mean, a couple of years ago, Jeannie and I were out west and we rented a car and and uh, this car was a um, uh, hybrid and uh, we had a great time and, and the, the next uh, time we had to rent a car was a few weeks later and we rented another hybrid. And the guy said, oh, do you know how this works? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah we had one just a few weeks ago. We're, we're fine. So we go up to, from the airport and jump in the car. And, you know, the, the key you don't have to have in the ignition, uh, of course, many cars are starting to do that, but uh, hybrids, I think, were one of the first to do that. And so I got in the car, and as with the one previously, all I needed to do was have the key in my pocket, and I pushed the button, and nothing happened. Gee, that's strange. I pushed the button, and nothing happened. I pushed the button, and nothing happened. And she we start looking around, and I'm getting ready to go back in and ask for instructions because I don't know the protocol for driving this car. I realize I don't know the protocol. And if I don't know the protocol, I can't drive the car. Well, Jeannie, fortunately, is looking around in the dash with me, and she spies this little opening that's about the size of the key that they gave us. And so I poke my finger in the opening to see if there's a button in there. There's no button. And then we realize it's the size of the key, and, well, let's try that. And so we push it in, and darn, you know, it fits, but the car still won't start. I don't know the protocol for starting the car. Finally, I remember that with the previous car, I had to have my foot on the brake when I put it in, or actually when I, when I would push the start button. So I put my foot on the brake, this little key, this keyless key is in the, uh, in the dash, and lo and behold, push the button, the car starts. Now, I could have sat there for a thousand years, and if I didn't know the protocol, I wouldn't have driven a mile. Yeshua had a protocol for understanding his work. Any word spoken out of a hostile or fearful mind is not true about his teachings. And so many people out there have been abused by those who've interpreted through hostility and fear something they had absolutely no business interpreting, making up stories, making up things that have nothing to do with truth. And then with fear and trembling, terrifying people into believing it. If you got terrified in there, you don't have the truth about that teachings of that man or the teachings of the scriptures. And if you've got somebody who's done abuse around it, you're not dealing with a representative of those teachings. You're dealing with something else. And sometimes it's really, you know, difficult to recognize that uh, we haven't been shown the truth. But if you were told the truth by a mind that the next time you heard them speaking was in rage, <laughs> you weren't listening to the truth. And as you recognize that, you start to move back to a love-based mind. You know, this, this work, what we're looking to do with this work is to convert every mind, heart, and being on the planet. And, you know, the, the non-being mind, the hostile and fearful-based mind uh, pretends that uh, that idea of conversion is about bringing people into their church. No, 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 nothing to do with it. Conversion is taking those who've lost their human lives, who live in a hostility and fear-based mind, and converting them back to a love-based mind. It's where we're designed to live as humans. It's the first law to understand anything you said. You've got to have that experience. Without that experience, without that protocol, you can't live the rest of it. You can't understand the rest of it. And those in hostility and fear have made up all kinds of insane stories. So we're here to rectify some of those stories, to clarify them in ourselves, and to, uh, to work through individually and collectively what we need to work through to get back to living 24-7, 365 in a love-based mind. What an awesome place to be. And people say, well, but I, I could never do that because look what Harry just did. Look what Charlie just did. Excuse me. I don't care what Harry just did. I don't care what Charlie just did. Got nothing to do with the state of your mind. Well, yeah, but they made me. Well, no, that's a lie. They didn't make you do anything. They didn't make you feel anything. If you had a feeling in there, they could sure bring it up. They could sure resonate it for you. They could get it moving and going in you. But well, what was going in you was yours. It wasn't Harry's or Charlie's. And uh, uh, on that turns everything. Because we live in a culture that's got everybody else to blame for what's going on in everybody else's life. 
know, they made me mad, they made me sad, they made me afraid. Nobody can make you anything that isn't in you, and if it's based in hostility or fear, then it's time to get rid of it. We're here to support you in learning and to support ourselves. You know, we're all in this boat together. I don't know anybody that's perfect or complete but to support us in moving forward as actual human beings, the, the active presence of love moving forward in the world and removing everything, the, 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 to remove the very capacity to even produce in your physiology any form of hostility or fear is where we ultimately want to go. Not an easy mark to hit, but it's possible. So some but of the conversation... Any conversation in the chat room, sweetie? Yeah, some of the conversation was going on about that, you know, out of the different filters and everything that love was definitely uh, the best option in relationships. And I said, well, it's the best option, too, when someone's out to get you. You mentioned last night in the workshop that when you're in fear that actually your peripheral vision is narrowed and uh, that you really want to have love conscious so that you've got a full view of what's going on to protect yourself. So I thought that was a cool point. But there was a couple of questions came out of the uh, chat room, and one of them was, um, can you discuss a little bit about the 9-bit mind? And somebody else said, is that the 9-bit 2.0 or (laughs) (laughs) 3.0? But then they also wanted you to um, elaborate a little bit and talk about um, the importance of prayer versus meditation, what's the difference there, and the importance of it on a daily basis. So you've got two things there, the nine-bit mind and then the difference between prayer and meditation. Okay. Well, there's some Harvard research, and, and I've just coined the term the nine-bit mind to represent uh, the data that came out of that Harvard research where what they told us is that uh, in doing measurements in the laboratory in a time frame where 10,000 brain cells fire, that in that 10,000 brain cells firing, the mind selects a maximum of nine bits of data to build the world you see, to build the pictures that you see. You have an analog converter in your mind that takes an energetic digital world and turns it into pictures, and the pictures are always an outpicture of what's on the inside. And so the max amount of data that can get into our conscious awareness, according to that research, is nine bits out of 10,000. And it's been estimated that in the same time frame, we've got approximately 20 trillion bits of data potentially available in the actual world. So here we stand around looking at nine bits of data at a 20 trillion bit world, and we think we know what's going on up there. <laughs> and the truth is, what you always know is what's going on inside of you. If you're in denial and dissociation of what's going on inside of you, then you project it into your brain's image of someone else. They show up in your mind with your nine bit bits attached, and you think that what you're experiencing is them with the problem. But the feeling that you're experiencing comes from the content of your own multi-generational database, and if there's hostility or fear in it, then better collapse that projection. And the forgiveness process is how you collapse that projection. By the way, if you want to, if you are not familiar with the forgiveness worksheet, the reality management worksheet, if you go to www.whyagain.com, Uh, There's a link to Holistic Lifestyles Radio, and on Tuesday's show, we had a young lady named Pamela who was brave enough to volunteer to come online with us, and she uh, went through, we walked her through the whole worksheet process. So there's step one all the way through to step seven with an explanation. Now, it's brief, but it covers the whole process of forgiveness from the Aramaic. So you can go to our website and click on the link to Holistic Lifestyles Radio. And I'm not sure, how you got that link tagged, honey? Has it got the uh, worksheet uh, name on it on our website? The uh, one with Pam, if you, if you go to it, it actually, I've got it marked that it's uh, WWNN, and I actually say that it is walking through a worksheet with Pamela Gregory. Cool. So, and that's the link that goes through the Holistic Lifestyles Radio? Actually, they don't. They have not given me their download link yet. I wrote them an email this morning asking them. So for right now, um, you can go through their link to listen to the show, but they have not given me a link to a download yet. So right now, the archives are strictly off of their website. As soon as I hear back from him, I will um, have it rerouted so that it does go through them because that will give them more... Uh, coverage that you know people are are linking on it will benefit them it will benefit us too so 
But until I get that, the only place right now you can get it is off of their website. Okay, cool. But anyway, you can click on there and uh, and get a copy of the link. And or you could go to uh, holisticlifestylesradio.com and look for, do a search for uh, uh, Michael Rice and Forgiveness Radio. They, they and, don't have it out there yet, sweetie. Oh, it's not Oh, at all? Okay. All right, well, I'll give John a call. I didn't know that. I'll give John a call and ask him uh, what we need to do to get that handled because uh, he wanted us to make sure we click through to their site so they know what's happening to the show. This was our first show on Holistic Lifestyles Radio, and we acknowledge and thank uh, John Hollis for uh, for inviting us to be a host on his show. And every Tuesday uh, we do a concurrent show with this one. Uh, there won't be call-ins on that Tuesday show because it's on uh, a 50,000-watt uh, radio station and due to liability issues, uh, we won't be taking call-ins that go out over the air. But uh, if you're in uh, South Florida, that station broadcasts on... 1470 AM all the way from uh, Port St. Lucie down to uh, Miami. And uh, so you can tap into our show there uh, every Tuesday from 2 until 3 o'clock. And uh, and Holistic Lifestyles Radio is sponsoring us there. And we are uh, delighted to be uh, able to touch that South Florida audience. And, and the show also goes out and streams to about 70 different markets. And uh, we would love your support if you give it a day or two until we get the, that link up. Uh, and then if you just, if everyone who's listening would just get everybody you know to uh, to uh, blast Holistic Lifestyles Radio with uh, with clicks to uh, to download that, then they'll know that uh, it's popular enough for them to want to do more. And uh, it would be awesome to uh, get to where we can do five days a week uh, concurrent. That would be just uh, fabulous if we were to be able to set that up and, and make that happen. So that uh, we have the opportunity to touch more lives with uh, with the principles of forgiveness. So the nine bit mind is a tiny fragment, and it, it's it's evidential in nature, meaning that the only thing your nine bit mind can do is show you the evidence you give it permission to show you. So if you deny ownership for something that's going on in your life, and you've been through it eighty seven different times with forty two different people, that denial is saying to your mind, mind, you are not allowed to show me this accurately nor truly. And so your mind won't see it. You'll never see it directly, which means you are now powerless over it. You know, one of the first steps, we're talking about correlating with the AA program. One of the first steps in, uh, in AA is realizing I'm powerless over my life. And the whole key there is our denial. The denial hides a part of the mind. It creates, literally, a dissociated mind. And that dissociated mind, when we're in it, means that it's not changeable, means that it's not under our control. We are truly powerless over it. The forgiveness process collapses the dissociated mind and gives us direct access to the information, which is when we can change it. And, of course... Uh, because the quantity of data in this database is so huge and we're processing through it with a nine-bit mind, you're not going to get very far on your own. <laughs> it takes the help of a higher power. And so realizing you're powerless and, and that there's a need for assistance. And there is assistance within us. And because we, of course, have free will, it won't change our mind for us unless we ask for help in doing it. And then that power will go to work for us and assist in changing the dynamics that, you know, perhaps we've sworn a thousand times. You go back in the in the Aramaic teachings, you hear Paul and he talks about how, you know, he's, he's written this awesome, wonderful stuff about love. And then, and then he says, of course, when the stress is up and the chips are down, why is it the things I would do, I cannot do? And the things I hate are what I do. Paul was powerless over his own dissociated mind. And he didn't know how to change it. He didn't know how to get into it. So, of course, he couldn't teach the rest of the world how to get into it and how to change it. The man named Yeshua knew exactly how to get into it and exactly how to change it. You'll notice he said, here's what I'm going to do, and that's what he did. Paul said, here's what I want to do, and I can't. Now, if you want to be empowered in your life, there's somebody who knew how to do it. Not a religious figure, just here's how this multi-generational database works. And when you've got the tools and you have the understanding, 
you'll be able to change a thousand generations of those family dynamics, move to a new place. The question was asked as well. Any other questions on that topic? Does that sound like it covers it to uh, everybody's satisfaction? Any other thoughts on that before we move forward with the other question? Uh, no, I think that pretty much covers it. Cool. Fabulous. Well, there was a, a request about a distinction between um, prayer and meditation. And meditation. Mm-hmm. In the Aramaic language, the word prayer means, quite literally and shockingly to some, the word prayer means to set a trap for God, which sounds kind of strange at first, but uh, when you look at the fact that we live in an energetic world, it makes absolute perfect sense that the human form is a trap for love. If you, if you look at the ancient scriptures, the definition of God is love. It's the stuff we're made of. If you look at human life, you know, everybody holds a newborn. Everybody describes a newborn the same. Every word used to describe a newborn, everywhere we ask the question is, it's always some variation on the theme of love. We're designed for that. And then we come in and the world starts to put its thumbprints on us. And we get trapped in all kinds of hostilities and fears. And we stop serving our function, our purpose, as the place where love shows up in the world. When you When you think of... Uh, from a physics point of view, to set a trap for love, for God. You know, if you watch television and, you know, you maybe don't have an antenna on your roof anymore, but there was a time when you had an antenna on the roof and the antenna had to be the right shape antenna. You couldn't live in Buffalo, New York and bring it down to Fort Lauderdale and, and expect to get very good reception on any station because the antenna in Buffalo, New York had to be a certain shape to pick up the frequency. Shape determines frequency had to be a certain shape to pick up the frequencies of channel 7, channel 5, whatever stations were there. Down here, the different frequencies, so it takes a different style of antenna. And then the antenna has to be oriented properly. If it's oriented properly and it's the right style of antenna, that antenna becomes a perfect trap for channel 4. And so you get a beautiful, clear picture and sound when the trap is oriented properly. We are designed, human form is designed to be a place where the active presence of love shows up in the world. Our structure is an antenna to bring that into the world. If you doubt that, just hold a newborn for 30 seconds and then tell me you still doubt it. And, of course, we get all kinds of philosophers who've done all kinds of mental masturbation about, oh, human life is this, and human life is that, and then it's a piece of protoplasm, and you're nothing, you're no different than a, a cow out in the field. You're just a chunk of protoplasm that happened to evolve in a different way. Excuse me, baloney. Just not true. If you have any question, hold a newborn and then tell me about it you will know what the active presence of love is. And you will know what human life is. And you were designed for that human life. And the world came along, sadly in a lot of cases, in churches, and put that hostility and fear into you. To me, that's one of the vilest and most violent things that's ever been done to a child. You know, Yeshua talked about the, the young child and said, such is the kingdom of heaven are these. And woe unto you who defile such a one. And the worst defiling you can do is to put hostility and fear into that child, especially fear of God, fear of love. What a, a, an abomination it is. And so we're designed to be to function as the active presence of love. And there are tools for returning to that. You look at the time frame when Yeshua came. There wasn't much of that around. It was a pretty heavy-duty society. And he came in with a set of tools and said, here's how you do it, folks. Follow me. Come on, let's go. Hey, come this way. And then he gave instructions. Most of those instructions have been disappeared. And it became a belief system. And his teaching wasn't about a belief system. His teaching was about having an experience. And the experience... He was supporting people in having was a direct experience of the active presence of the love of God in physiology. And when we're not experiencing that, we're not functioning as human beings. And part of our work is to restore human life to earth. So that's the Aramaic definition of prayer. Awesome. And we do have prayer. a question. We have a question. So, 415, you are on the air. 
Hi, I have a question. Um, I'm trying to get back in the swing of things, and I'm trying to reapply to law school, but I have a lot of fear and anxiety surrounding it. because I understand that when I did law school for three semesters. I know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and well, previously I was disqualified because I was sick, and so right. like now I'm very anxious about it, and I feel like I'm to the point where I'm so um Nervous about it, I become paralyzed and I don't do anything. Yeah, I hear that. So, so what I would suggest that you do? What's your name? Aisha. Aisha, nice to yeah. meet you, Aisha. Nice what I would you. suggest, that, what I would suggest that you do, is you jump on the website and www.whyagain.com, and on the right hand side, you'll see where Jean's got a link that says Download Worksheets, and I download the worksheets. I download the chapter 24. It's all free. You can download the book as well and read through the whole thing. But uh, download the worksheet and start to put the pen to the paper. And also you can uh, can click on the link on the home page for the show that we did on Tuesday. And it, we're walking a young lady through the worksheet process and shows you how to forgive. And so here's my offering to you is that in going through that experience, you took on a lot of fear, the energy, literally, frequencies of fear, uh, and, you know, I don't know what else, uh, perhaps inadequacy, inability, failure, whatever all the dynamics might have been around that. And mm-hmm. so it's it's a simple matter of putting the pen to the paper and deleting those energies. They're, they're just energies that have been accumulated in your structure, and as you use that worksheet, what will happen is you'll just delete them, you'll get rid of them, and you'll stand in clarity, you'll stand in power, and you'll be empowered to just go through that like uh, like nothing. It'll be easy. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate Delighted. it. Delighted. And, and, and as you uh, do those worksheets, uh, if you have any questions, that's what we're here for five days a week, to answer questions on that worksheet and support you in moving through it. Uh, things are going to come up. You know, one of the reasons why healing isn't all that popular is because healing is not tough to feel good. Uh, healing is uh, something that we need to uh, uh, become committed to going through whatever is in there. And uh, on the way back out, uh, it looks just the way it looked on the way in. And so it's not fun. It's not necessarily easy, but it's pretty simple and doable, step by step, if you go through the process. Where okay. you're you're in uh what area of the country is? Um, San Francisco, California. San Francisco, okay. I don't think there's a support group out there at this point, but uh but who knows? Uh listening on the radio station, start doing worksheets, you may become the one who starts a support group. That would be awesome. Yeah, that would be. All okay. right. How did you find out about the show? Um, I just did when on blog talk. Awesome. Well, it's a delight, and, you know, as you do some of those worksheets, if you have questions, please call us, and as you start to really get the hang of them, uh, please call us back and let us know how you're making out with them, how it's going, how things are looking to you. And what you'll find is your perspective will totally change as you go through that uh, removal. Again, forgiveness in the Aramaic sense is not about I'm going to forgive somebody else for something that's going on inside of me. It's the tool, it's the technology for going on inside yourself and removing what doesn't belong there. And so uh, hostility sure doesn't belong in you. And we'll just hold the space for you to just let it go and go on in law school and shine. And as you shine, you shine as a true human light and, and bring to that profession of, uh, of law that human light that is you and uh, bring, bring a transformation and upgrading of, of uh our whole legal system into truth and uh, and real, true human service. Well, and we'll be you. delighted to support you in it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, okay, so also, thank you. Oh, another thing, there's a couple people in the chat room that said they'd be willing to work with you and help you on it as well. Um, if you will email me, then I can put you in contact with them through email. Okay, great. Okay. And so you can email me at Jeannie, that's J-E-A-N-I-E, at Y again, W-H-Y-A-G-A-I-N dot com, and tell me who you are so that I can remember. And then uh, we're going out of town tomorrow and we'll be out of contact. So if you can send it to me um, before tomorrow afternoon. 
Okay. And then I'll get you in touch with the other people. There are uh, people who have been to Heartland and have done this work, and so that way you'll have a support system too. Well, thank you so much. So it's J E A N I E. Uh huh. At Y again W H Y A G A I N dot com. Okay. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for calling in. Have a good day. Bye bye. You- Bless you. Um, Michael, there's another question. Um, sorry, I just turned myself off, I think. <laughs> um, Did, but before somebody, we go to another question, honey, uh, uh-huh. we were we were moving in the direction of answering the meditation piece in there. So let's, oh, okay. let's just finish that aspect of that. it okay. before Sounds we move good. to that. Yeah, cool. Oh, okay. So the, uh, the idea of prayer is to be the space where the active presence of love shows up in the world. Meditation, I believe, properly used, is a way to move into direct contact, to still and quiet the mind so that you can be out of your mind and be in direct relationship with that love instead of filtering it through whatever dynamics are happening uh, in that multi-generational database that we spoke about. And so meditation is designed to still the mind. Now, my experience is that I've seen people who've been long-term meditators and they create all kinds of havoc in their lives. And because they have no tools with which to undo the havoc, they use meditation to go and get quiet and get back to a peaceful state. And then they go create more havoc and then they use it and they kind of use meditation as a drug. Uh, and uh, what I suggest is that you use forgiveness first to clear the garbage out and then use meditation to go to that spontaneous connected space. You know, there's some interesting research in a book by uh, Joseph Chilton Pierce, and I'm not sure it's been several years since I looked at it, but it's either in his book Magical Child or Magical Child Matures, both awesome books. And what he recounts is the common link that they found in research with brilliant, happy children and the common link with brilliant, happy children is that they all had plenty of blank staring time as kids. You know, the thing where we weren't allowed to do it, and you sat in school and you were blank staring time, you were looking out the window, you were called daydreaming? Well, no, that's spontaneous meditation. That's connecting directly to the mind of God. This culture doesn't want you doing that. That's why we got to wrap across the knuckles with a ruler and get back to work. We have things for you to learn. We want you to be a good commercial servant. We don't want you to be in a relationship with love because you're not much used that way. And so um, meditation is that spontaneous connecting to that love and allowing yourself to be flushed by that love and achieving a true human life, which is one where there is the experience 24-7, 365, of the active presence of love. So you have another question, sweetie? Um, well, we're less than a, a minute away, so I'm not sure we can cover it, but they had looked at the filters and they saw the Rockman and the Cuba and wanted to know the difference between those two. We can cover that very quickly. Rockma is a filter over intentions. Cuba is a filter over perception. Rock- mm-hmm. Rockma allows the mind to only pass intentions that are keyed to love to be used in the mind. Kuba, over perception, allows only perceptions keyed to love to pass to be used in forming your perception. And so those two filters together were called perfect love. And you remember they said perfect love casts out fear. When we have that condition, it's called perfect love. In that state of perfect love, the mind cannot generate a fear-based reality. And that was the ultimate goal of the work from day one. That's the ultimate goal of what we want to support every mind, heart, and being on the planet having. The absolute active presence of love, 24-7, 365. And if you're in South Florida, come and join us for a free series of workshops that will start on March the 6th. We'll be doing six days of Free workshops at Unity and Pompano, and then the, um, the follow that following weekend, the 13th and 14th, we'll do a two-day mini intensive uh, here 13. in Fort Lauderdale. The 12th and 13th. Okay, so 
for the 12th and 13th. If you want to get away from the, those northern climbs and come and play in for a little bit, please do. And otherwise, please take the tools. Please pass them to someone else. Let somebody else know about the radio show and have the best year yet of your eternal life. We hold you in the blessing. <laughs>